Okay. Uh, uh, hi, everybody. First of all, thanks for having me. This is my first time in, in Stockholm. It's been great. I really appreciate Nordic APIs uh, inviting me to come and talk to you today. Um, so, uh, hi. My name is Rich Jones. Uh, I'm the founder and CTO of a company called Gun.io. We are uh, a uh, globally distributed uh, consulting agency made out of the best uh, open source hackers. Uh, we help companies build awesome stuff. Uh, but today, uh, I'm going to talk to you about building serverless API backends. So you just learned about building serverless API backends. So hopefully, this will reinforce some of the things that you, uh, that you just learned. Uh, I'm going to give you kind of a different perspective on it, because uh, you, you'll see why. And uh, I'm also just going to barrage you with information as well. So I think it would be better to overwhelm you and then answer your questions later. Uh, so. Uh, but also feel free to, to shout if, if something is confusing as well. Um, so serverless, what does that mean? You probably, this is like one of the big buzzwords for, for the year. Uh, it's, if you read Hacker News, you've probably seen serverless a lot. Uh, when you see serverless, most of the time you can translate that into meaning no permanent infrastructure. So uh, no maintenance of your servers, not having to worry about uh, load balancers, ELBs, or doing uh, OS-level security patches, or worrying about servers going down and the downtime that you have associated with that. And basically, the just peace of mind of not having to worry about keeping your servers online. Also, you can fire ops team. Um, and now you're probably thinking, uh, that sounds great. How do I get started? Uh, and the best way to get started is by using a framework called Zappa. Uh, full disclosure, I wrote the framework called Zappa. It's been my baby for the past couple of months. There are other uh, serverless frameworks that you can use out there. Zappa is better, uh, so you should just use that. Uh, and it's built on top of AWS Lambda and AWS API Gateway. There are other uh, cloud function providers now. Uh, like uh, we just saw Microsoft Azure, there's Google Cloud Functions, there's uh, IBM's offering, whatever that is called. But AWS Lambda is like far and away uh, the leader in the space. I mean, it's been out for, for years. It's just far more capable uh, in pretty much every regard. So uh, the others are still playing catch up. But quite frankly, if you're serious about using this stuff in production, you really do want to use Lambda, at least for right now. Uh, that's, that's not, a, that's just, that's true. And I'm sorry, I'm sorry to, to Microsoft. But and they're, they're catching up quickly, but Lambda came out first, and it's, it's far and away uh, the leader in the field. Um, so Zappa is main uh, advantage as a framework is you can get all the benefits for serverless computing uh, for your existing APIs. Um, assuming that you're using Python, which you should be because Python is the best language. So with a traditional web server, uh, you, you all know this already, but just as a quick recap, you have a web server, probably Apache or Nginx, that's listening for uh, events as they come in. Uh, that then hands it off to your uh, WSCI Whiskey server, which sends it to your, uh, your Python application, which processes the request. Uh, it sends it back to the client, and it goes back to listening. The problem with this, obviously, is that if you have a huge spike in traffic, that it's only going to deal with those uh, in, in a serial fashion. So sometimes, if it can't get to the ones at the back of the queue in time, they'll time out, and you'll have it, your pages down or slow for those uh, late in the queue visitors. So this is how uh, a web request works using Zappa. So the request comes in through a product called API Gateway. That API Gateway request is then mapped to uh, uh, a dictionary using something called velocity template language, which is this arcane like printing formatting thing from the past. I learned it so you don't have to. Uh, after the request comes in through the API gateway, that's when your server is spawned. Uh, the server then converts that dictionary that comes in through the API gateway into uh, a standard Python whiskey, feeds it to your application. Your application then returns it. It passes through the API gateway, and the server is destroyed. So, uh, and that all happens in less than 30 milliseconds. Uh, by the time the user actually sees the page, the server that served it is gone, which is actually like a pretty zen thing if you think about it. Um, and this comes with a, a whole bunch of huge advantages. So, number one is is scalability. Like I wrote this thing because. Uh, 
uh, to destroy ops. Like I was, I was working with a client. And it was like we could just avoid all this product, you know. So I basically spent like six months to save two hours. Uh, so with with uh, uh, a serverless infrastructure, each request corresponds to its own server, which means that one request is one server. But this scales all the way up. And once you take the training wheels off your AWS account, you can go to literally trillions of events per year if you deploy your application globally. So, uh, and that's just out of the box. You don't have to do literally anything uh, to make that happen. So it, it's, uh, it's great. And it's also, at the same time, orders of magnitude less expensive. So you pay by the millisecond. So it's 0. 0.0000, however many zero two. Uh, micro sense per millisecond, which is 0 0.0081 cr you know, cron per millisecond. Uh, I've been dealing with the like currency exchange. Pro is it really $20 for a gin and tonic? Here, I was like, that just can't be right. <laughs> uh, plus, if you're a first time Amazon customer, you get 3 million free seconds. So if you're using this for like small projects or internal APIs, it's basically free. So this is just for my own personal projects. I had four VPS boxes, uh, like $20 a month droplets on DO. And I was actually paying like a grand a year just to keep those online and having to spend the time to like keep them patched and all that. Um, and then I converted them to Zappa. And now you know, I saved $1,000 a year for my own projects out of the box. So it was like, great. Um, and the, the big thing here is that you also don't need to modify your existing applications if you're already using uh, Python. Uh, because it's all based around Whiskey, you're also, there's no vendor lock-in, which is a huge one if you're trying to sell this to your companies, because they don't want to commit to a cloud vendor. But it's like, OK, you know, we can try it out without having to like, rewrite the application. If we want to leave and go back to, to our colo, we can. Uh, sorry, Jeff Bezos. Yeah, because it works with any Whiskey application. Um, here's some guy on Twitter who did it and saved a bunch of money and didn't have to do anything, so that's cool. Uh, it's super easy to start. Once you've got Zappa installed, Zappa init. Uh, this will automatically like set up everything for you. It'll detect the type of application that you have, create the, uh, like the, the host for it, create the permissions. The I IAM is uh, Amazon's hosted like identity and permissions service, so it'll set that all up for you automatically. Uh, it's super easy to deploy. You type deploy. Uh, it's this is really good for microservice. So if you have small APIs, or if you're doing an IoT or a chatbot or something like that, it's 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 super good. But it also works with uh, like more traditional CMSs like Django and and stuff like that. Uh, the big thing, I mean, if you're talking about serverless uh, like architectures, it's not just deploying your stuff to the cloud. It's also being able to build uh, event-driven applications. Uh, and we're going to get more. Uh, into that in a second, but it's really easy if you want to set that up. So you just define your function in the settings and then uh, the event that you want to react to, and we'll, we'll see this in a little more detail in a second. You can also use time uh, as an event source, so rather than setting up celery or cron or anything like that, like if any, you've ever set up celery, you know it's like it's a big pain in the butt. Uh, it's this, you just type, you know, it's one line of configuration and then your function will automatically execute uh, at any rate you specify. Uh, you get free uh, SSL out of the box. Just type certify. It'll set up your domain in Route 53 and, and automatically do the uh, Let's Encrypt uh, DNS challenges. So you just get free auto-renewing certificates out of the box, which is super handy, uh, and a bunch more other stuff. So now you're like totally convinced to use this, but you're wondering, like, how else can I use this like cool new class of technology? Uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit about actually designing serverless architectures. Um, in this case, reading robust, capable applications that don't have any permanent infrastructure. Um, the main point is here is that your code executes only in response to events that happen in your larger AWS ecosystem. So that can mean things like file operations. So if you want to have code that's executed in response to an upload that happens, like uh, the simplest example here would be uh, if a user uploads an image and you want to turn their big picture into like a little avatar or something like that, rather than having to wait, you know, when they upload, do that all in the space of that request or set up a whole queuing system or anything like that, you can literally just have your thumbnailing service execute in response totally asynchronously and non-blocking for, uh, you know, their 
So it's, it's kind of perfect for stuff like that. You also have a native cloud-hosted queue, uh, SQS and SNS, that'll handle that. Um, notifications, so if they send a support email or if you set up a, you know, a text service or they send you a, a Facebook message, you can have that be an event trigger as well. So execute, rather than polling for new emails that come in, you can ex execute in response to that. Um, you can also treat HTTP, HTTP itself as an event source. Uh, if you have both uh, HTTP event triggers and other like event triggers, that's called a hybrid architecture. Um, you can also use database activity as an event trigger. So if something, if one of your tables has a has a column that gets updated, you can define that as the source of the event. But if you're doing that, just make sure that your API is still the like, prime resource of truth in your application. Like I see people who will have an API, but then inside of their event functions, like still make SQL calls or ORM or calls or whatever. Like you still probably want to go through your um, uh, API. So yeah, basically, rather than maintaining machines that are set up permanently to pull your event sources, just like set up these event triggers to execute in response to them happening. Again, time is an event source, so if you want to have regularly occurring uh, tasks, you can do that as well. Uh, Again, if you're starting to, to design more serverless event-driven applications, keep in mind that you know, vendor lock-in is still a problem. So uh, a lot of these services do have uh, free and open source uh, compatible uh, offerings as well. So like uh, React is S3 compatible, IBM's OpenWhisk is Lambda compatible, and there's a, there's a couple others out there as well. And try to decouple that code when you're actually writing it. So like don't hard code add item to SQS, like write a generic add item to Q function and then have a dispatcher based on your environment inside of that function, uh, which also helps with testing. Uh, if you want to like testing cloud functions is probably something that you've thought about as well, because you're like, how do I like write an application that's based around something that's in the cloud without having to actually like have their remote infrastructure? And you can actually use a library called Placebo that will then record every uh, interaction that you have with AWS, and you can play that back during your testing so as if you were talking to, to AWS to set that up. Um, and generally. It's, you know, it takes a while to kind of think serverlessly. It's a paradigm shift. Um, uh, but basically, you want to avoid infrastructure. Like, do you actually need a database for this thing? Like, can you replace your database with a queue? Can you replace it with static hosting, stuff like that? As an example, if you look on my GitHub, I wrote a BitTorrent tracker that doesn't have a database, but it can still handle literally, uh, you know, like 50 million peers out of the box, uh, just using S3 as a, as a JSON data store. Uh, like that won't work for all applications, but depending on like the type of traffic that you're receiving, it, it, it might. Uh, you can use Zappa integrates really nicely with with CI as well for your for your blue green deployment. So you can like have different environments and make sure that uh, everything's going smoothly when you do testing, staging, uh, and prod. Uh, you can also deploy your application globally to get better speed for people in different regions. So. Uh, Lambda functions are available in like nine or eleven different regions around the globe now, and you can, you're p with a single command, deploy, deploy your application to the whole planet. So people in Japan won't have like a, whatever it is, like 200 millisecond overhead to access your application in Virginia. You can actually deploy it to the Asian region, so then they only have the the 20 millisecond ping. Um, Wow, okay, so you're starting to understand some of the capabilities. Like, can we see like a more complex example? Sure, yeah, we can. Uh, so uh, I'm gonna show you how to clone uh, a service that I worked on called Kickflip, uh, which was uh, uh, an SDK for mobile developers to add live streaming video to their applications. Um, so a live video stream is actually just a series of static video streams and uh, a manifest file, which is a list of the current, like the, what chunks of video are available at the time, uh, that then keeps updating. So this is perfect for us uh, because we can use our hybrid architecture to have uh, HTTP and non-HTTP uh, event sources. So e the upload of each video chunk from the mobile phone will then trigger our Lambda function that will update the manifest file. So people watching the stream will, will be able to see the latest video chunk. And we're going to do that with no permanent infrastructure, no operations. Uh, so we want to build something that is an authenticated API, super low latency, super low cost, infinitely scalable out of the box, and not have to worry about operations to do it. And to build that, we're going to use uh, 
um, uh, Amazon's API gateway service. We're going to build our API using Lambda, Zappa, and Flask, which is a, a Python micro, micro service for web. Uh, S3 for our file storage for the video chunks that get uploaded, and we're going to deliver the whole thing globally on an Amazon CDN cloud front. Um, there's some code here. It's not like, like obviously, if you want to use this in production, you want to like add some more stuff to it, but it, it'll work. Um, so first step is the client needs to authenticate with the API. Uh, you set API required uh, to true. It's like that. It's that simple. And then you can use uh, Amazon's managed uh, uh, API key service to handle that for you. Or you can write a custom handler just by defining a custom authorizer. So if you want to set up OAuth or whatever janky hand-rolled crypto thing that your your company says that you have to use, you can just write it as a single function and then, and then uh, tie that in, super easy. Uh, so the client will then authenticate with the API. Now you can talk to the, to the application once, you, once you're passing in the right credentials. The API is going to return a temporary access token that will only allow the user who's currently using the service to upload into the bucket uh, into a certain location, into like their user uh, location in the in the bucket for a limited period of time. So essentially, what we're what we're doing here, like this is this is the whole server, uh, which is which is cool, right? So um, we ha we're defining a policy that allows the S3 put object permission, and then we're getting a temporary uh, federation token that gives. Uh, so we'll return a key pair that's attached to a temporary account with this permission with it, and then returning that uh, through the API. So uh, essentially, like you know, bucket location slash username slash stream ID slash star. Uh, so then the client will get this token from the API. They'll connect into S3. Uh, they'll get the bucket. They'll upload the file. This is just this is client code. You don't need to worry about this as much. This is the interesting part, though. So once they upload the video chunk from their video stream, then our, uh, our function will execute. And we can actually define. So we have an update manifest function that's going to list the contents of the buckets and update the, the, the stream manifest with the new thing that's been added to it so the people watching the video stream can get the latest stuff. And we can actually have this function execute into whenever a file is uploaded to uh, uh, into this path, like this regular expression defines like when this this function will execute. Uh, if there's a new object created at this location, execute this function. Um, this is what that function would do. Basically, you get you get the event and the context of of that event uh, in your function, then respond to it accordingly. In this, we just uh, create a new manifest and 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 upload it to the correct location, and then we want to serve that on a CDN rather than out of the bucket, so we get nice low latency. You just check the box. Uh, it's that easy, and then you have a video stream uh, that works out of the box. Bam! We have a serverless streaming video server in 42 lines of Python. So if you want to write like a Twitch clone or have your own bootleg put locker, like watch pirated TV on Amazon, you can do it out of the box. In conclusion, save time, save money, uh, use Zappa. Tons of your favorite companies are already using it in production, which is dope. Uh, try it out for your apps, or you should hire me to build you new apps. Um, you can check it out. It's all free and open source software on my GitHub. We have a cool Slack with lots of smart people doing really interesting stuff. Uh, uh, use it, using Zappa, shout out to the Slack channel watching this on YouTube. Uh, thanks, everybody. Uh, questions? Yeah.